Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Allie, and if you saw by the title, this is another true crime video. I haven't done one of these in a really long time. These are by far my favorite ones to film, they're my favorite ones to research, and they get the most traffic on my channel, which I actually think is really cool. Um, but today is a little bit different because I wanted to explore more than just a crime that happened and actually explore like why I think this crime happened. And and I think the reason this crime happened is a lot deeper than just toxic masculinity even, but we're gonna get into it. Um, this video was months in the making because I meant to do this back in like January or February when the documentary came out. And then COVID happened, quarantine happened, and just all this shit happened and I never got around to it. But now I'm, I'm ready to talk about it because I think it's important. I do have a script written out, so if you see me look down at any point, I'm not gonna focus on it too much, but you will be seeing me read my notes because I can't memorize things and I'm going to try to look in the camera as much as possible because that's my biggest critique that I always get on these videos is that I'm looking away so I do have to check to make sure that my time. I will also say that there's going to be several disclaimers in this video. This video is not designed to offend anyone. Um, I obviously will be inserting my opinions because that's just the way these videos work but don't think that I'm directly you know trying to offend you. That's not what this video is about at all. Be open-minded, even if you're a football fan, even if you play football, if you're a man, any of those things, take a deep breath. This isn't an attack against you, okay? Let's get started. So back in January, I watched the documentary. My dad's using the litter box right as this fucking video is starting, of course. Um, I watched Aaron Hernandez documentary that was put out on Netflix. I knew who he was, but I wasn't familiar, as familiar with him as I was about other cases in the true crime realm. I was actually so unfamiliar with him that I thought he murdered his wife. Like, I was sure that he was a domestic abuser and he'd abused his wife. I did know he killed himself in prison because it was all over the news, but I really didn't know much about him. Right before the documentary came out, our library actually had, I think I had ordered or someone had ordered um, his like autobiography or biography or something like that. And I think his brother released a book that came out fairly recently. So I had planned on reading that, but then this documentary came out and being a true crime buff and also being pretty into football, I decided to watch it. Uh, surprisingly, I do and have always followed football up until recently. We don't have cable, so I don't watch it now. I'm so sorry if you can hear the litter box. It's my cat. He'll be done in a second. Like, our apartment is small. We live in a 900 square feet apartment, so like, there's only so much, you know? So, yeah, I am familiar with football. I do like football. I indulge in football like the average American, or I did back when I had cable. But I didn't follow a lot of some of the things that I'm going to talk about. I don't really follow, follow college football either. Most importantly, this video isn't really even about Aaron Hernandez. Uh, when I initially wanted to talk about this case, it was going to be. But then as I dove deeper into the documentary and then into my own research about Urban Meyer, about the New England Patriots, and about football in general, I kind of realized that this case is, is not uncommon. This case isn't unfamiliar. This is a case that we see time and time again. And I think this case at its core is about toxic masculinity and it's about toxic jock culture, toxic football culture, whatever you want to call it. I don't think football culture is necessarily an actual thing, but I do think that the culture of football in America not even sports, truly just football in America. It can have a lot of negative implications about how we view men, but most importantly, how we view women. And it has almost a religious cult-like obsession here where we view football players and football coaches as gods and they can do no wrong. And yeah, that's, that's my perception. And there's a pattern that became very, very apparent as I was going through this case and several other ones. I want to say again, I'm not anti-football. I'm not anti-masculinity. This is not a call to ban football. I think there's bad seeds in every industry, but there is a lot of bad seeds in the sports industry, like, like far too many. And I'm using a lot of true examples of true cases that cannot be disputed. Take everything with a grain of salt. If you really think this video is going to piss you off, like there's no reason for you to watch it. I'm not in the in the game to like really make you so mad that you like want to kill me. But at the same time, you know, just maybe this video isn't for you if you have strong emotions about this. So 
I want to get into the case first. Uh, if you haven't seen the documentary, it's called Killer Inside the Mind of Aaron Hernandez. Definitely focus more on the psychology of Aaron um, and also on the case itself. And I think regardless, it did itself in a very easy, digestible way. Like you could watch it in one day. And the crime itself was interesting just from a true crime standpoint. So if you're into true crime, I think you'd really enjoy the documentary. And I mean, if you don't want spoilers, don't watch this video. But I mean, like it, it I don't know, I always feel weird saying spoilers when it's a nonfiction thing. But the crime that he's most known for, the murder he's most known for, is the murder of Odin Lloyd. He was killed on June 17th, 2013 in Massachusetts. He was a linebacker for the Boston Bandits, which is a semi-professional uh, football team. He was loved by his family, his friends, and his fiance, excuse me, his girlfriend, whose name was Shania, Shania Jenkins, uh, who's actually the sister of Aaron's fiance. I'm, I'm assuming that's how they know each other. He had a positive influence on everyone that came in contact with him. Everyone said he was a very nice guy. He seemed like a very nice guy. And it's really sad that, um, that he had to pass away because he was obviously very loved by his family and his friends. So, uh, he's the true victim here. I just want everyone to remember that, that there are actual victims in this case that are not Aaron Hernandez. That is something that I was very critical of when watching the documentary that yes, this was about Aaron Hernandez, but this was about so much more than that. And we need to remember that real lives were lost here. Odin was killed in what can only be described as a gang style, execution style killing. Uh, they found him in an industrial park and he was killed by Aaron and two of Aaron's other friends. Uh, Carlos Ortiz and Ernest Wallace and there was an overwhelming amount of evidence of this crime and that they committed it and it was apparent that from the get-go Aaron was attempting to destroy evidence. Um, he didn't even have a motive that made sense other than some there was text messages text messages that insinuated that Odin had betrayed his trust in some way but there was no clear indication of any wrongdoing on Odin's part for him to deserve what happened to him. The way that Aaron acted after his arrest was incredibly shocking to me. Uh, during phone calls to his fiance and his daughter, he seemed to show very little remorse for what happened. Uh, he seemed very much confident that he wasn't actually ever going to go to prison. I don't wanna say it seemed like he was enjoying himself, but he requested things like Harry Potter books and just really didn't seem to be that affected by the fact that he was in jail and did not really seem to show any remorse for the fact that he had killed someone or allegedly killed someone. He had a very, I can get away with anything type of attitude. And I think a lot of this stemmed from his childhood and I think a lot of it stemmed from how he grew up. He grew up, Aaron grew up in Bristol, Connecticut and he had a really turbulent childhood. His dad was basically abusive and his mom was not much better. She had a lot of issues. And the only the only healthy role model he had in his life was his brother. He both of them were footballers most of their life. Aaron was a footballer for most of his life and he was being scouted by Yukon from the time he was a sophomore in high school. Could have been the best case scenario for him. This would have allowed him to be closer to his brother, who, like I said, was a really positive influence on him. But he ended up changing the entire trajectory of his life when he visited the University of Florida. And the same weekend that he went there, he signed with them. And like most big schools, he was given a full ride and he received a stipend, which would allow him to live comfortably in Florida, far away from family and friends. Now my cat is scratching. He graduated a year early from pressure from Urban Meyer, who coached Florida at the time. Urban Meyer is known for being a great football coach. He's also known for being a great sidekick um, by assisting friends, players, other coaches from getting away with things. So um, I do want to, and you kind of want to talk about that for a second, because there's been a lot of scandals by Urban Meyer. And... One of the biggest ones was from 2018. Uh, I actually remember this. I'm from Ohio, so I'm very familiar with Ohio State football. I'm not an Ohio State fan, uh, and I'm especially not an Urban Meyer fan, but uh, scandals rose to the surface when one of his assistant coaches was outed for domestic violence, and Urban allegedly helped cover it up. And one 
thing that happened when this came to surface, a lot of journalists began digging deeper into Urban, how he runs his teams, and how he runs his life, essentially. And in Florida, it was discovered that during his tenure there, he was there for six years and over 30 of his players were in trouble for domestic violence, assault, and a lot of other crimes. Urban was never held accountable, therefore he never held his players accountable. The worst thing that ever happened was a player being suspended for four games after it was found out that he was aggressively stalking his girlfriend and threatening to kill her. You could argue that personal problems don't affect their ability to play football, but with my job and most other jobs of people in America, if I was aggressively stalking my boyfriend and threatening to kill them, I would probably lose my job. So just keep that in mind. During Aaron's time in Florida, he definitely got into some trouble. He got into a bar fight. Uh, he punched a manager at a bar for refusing to serve him, um, or excuse me, for refusing to pay his tab. And it seemed like a very much like, do you know who I am type of situation. Um, he also got into some trouble for a shooting that happened in Gainesville. Urban's solution to all of this was to try to convince him to come to Bible study um, and to stop stop him from going home to visit his friends in Connecticut because he felt like uh, the people that he surrounded himself with in Connecticut were the problem because, because of the stipend that he was receiving, he was able to go home and visit friends and family a whole lot uh, during his time in Florida. But it is important to note that as far as I know, he never missed a game. It was around that time, I think you guys remember, that's when Tim Tebow also played for Florida. And between him and Tim Tebow, they were the stars of of Florida football. They were the stars of football in general. I remember that time. I remember I, I remember seeing Tim Tebow everywhere. I actually think I went to a Kentucky game and they played against Florida and I think I remember seeing Tim Tebow, which was really exciting. I was a big Tim Tebow fan. Them being so huge, it was it was apparent that they were gonna get drafted. They were so good. They were they were just stars of the NCAA, I guess. Is that the NCAA? I don't know. They were stars at that point. Um, and Aaron probably would have been a first round draft pick, but he was kind of a controversial person. People knew about his behavior and some things. So he actually, he wasn't a first round pick, but he still ended up getting drafted by the New England Patriots, which is a huge deal. He was a fifth round draft pick and a lot of people were concerned when he got drafted to the New England Patriots because again, in the documentary, it really tried to let you know that the crew that he was hanging out with back in Bristol was bad, that they were trouble, but we kind of forget that the crew he was hanging out with Boston, in Boston, he was also getting into trouble with them. He was also getting in trouble in Florida, so I don't attribute his issues to being too close to Bristol. I don't, I don't think Bristol is the problem, but a lot of his family was like, oh, it's Bristol is just a bad place. No, it's not Bristol. It's it's the person. In my research, I felt like Aaron was the ringleader of most of the crews that he hung out with to begin with. It was always him coming up with ideas, him doing all the bad shit and people just following along with whatever he said. And especially when he started to get famous, he used that fame to project himself as the leader of any pack that he was a part of. It seemed that the media even was trying to portray him as the young, attractive, racially ambiguous football player. And he was hanging out with mostly African-American men. So how could he be the bad one? That's media's perception. That is not my perception. But we know how it goes, right? At the end of the day, if Aaron was hanging out with a bunch of white guys, it would have been viewed totally different. In this case, he was hanging out with African-American men, so how could he be the bad one? It's a tale as old as time, y'all. I also saw a lot of things pop up in my research that I didn't love, that he was part of thug culture or gang culture. And again, I just, I just think there's a lot of race undertones in that. I don't think he was caught up in any type of culture. I think Aaron was just not a good person. And I don't think he was trying to replicate something in his life. A lot of, there were a lot of insinuations that he was trying to, ins to, to replicate this thug life. And I, I don't really think that that was it. This became worse when he went to Gainesville. And this was his first true access to power and the first time that he could use his power over people. And I just think ultimately the problem was he was never held accountable for any of his actions, ever. 
I wanted desperately for there to be a change. I wanted desperately to like start doing research and have some sort of positive outcome. But when I was preparing for this in February, it was found out that two Ohio State players were arrested for rape. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but they were dismissed from the team. And I don't think it's a coincidence that these were two African American players, but again, do with that information what you will, but I don't think we can ignore race in these types of instances. But I think that it's fair to say that other criminals have graced the field and have not been held to the same standard, um, regardless of race, because I will be talking about a lot of black men who also weren't held accountable, but I just, I did want to point out that, you know, I think it would be a totally different story, you know? Ray Lewis pled guilty to obstruction of justice in connection to a shooting in Atlanta and then went on to have a successful career. He was never held accountable. Michael Vick went to prison for dog fighting. And while he was let go uh, by the Ravens, he was picked up again by the Eagles and ended up having a successful career. He was never held accountable. Michael Floyd was arrested for a DUI. And while he was let go from the Cardinals, he went on to play for several other teams after that. He was never held accountable. And that's just the pro league. The list truly goes on and on. And not every sport is like this, and not every crime is held to the same standard. I know that Pete Ro Rose was permanently barred from baseball for betting allegedly on his own team. And I only know this because my dad talked about it a lot. We're big Cincinnati Reds people. And I think that is wrong. In the case of Aaron Hernandez, he was never held accountable for any of his actions. He wasn't held accountable for beating up a bartender. He wasn't held accountable for the shooting in Gainesville until after he'd been convicted of Odin Lloyd's murder. And in that case, it seemed that he was only being held accountable in, in order to avoid a, an appeal, which didn't work out in the prosecutor's favor since he was acquitted of that particular charge. That acquittal happened because despite being a convicted murderer, he still had access to one of the best defense attorneys in the business. And because his family was so loyal to them, to him, that they were willing to sacrifice their own freedom to help him acquire his. I want to kind of move along and talk about his sexuality just for a second, because there was a huge emphasis on this in the documentary. And I think this ties into that toxic jock culture perfectly because up until around 2016 in the sports world, being gay was a surefire way to end your career. It wasn't until 2014 that an openly gay player was drafted, but as far as I can tell, there hasn't been a single NFL player who was openly gay while playing in the NFL. It is more socially acceptable to be an abuser, i.e. Ray Rice, although he was reinstated and then just never played again or a cheater, i.e. Chad Johnson, than it is to be gay. The deeper and deeper that I went into this case, and many other cases all through the NFL and the NCAA, the values that they're teaching these players really shined through in the worst way. More than that, these values were ingrained into them well before they started college even. And I want you to think about that in the, for a minute. Think about your own high school, especially if you went to high school in a place that valued football. Think about how, I think of the football players there. Think of how they were treated. I think in America, and I, I, I think this is true for other sports and other places, but I think it's especially true here that masculinity is rewarded, especially if you're attractive. And it's rewarded even if it comes at the cost of women or someone that's less than you. Some of the biggest football players have scandals behind them. And I know I could go on and on, but we're supposed to blissfully ignore them as if we're talking about like these are the American dynasty for us. We don't have royalty, we have football players. And even Ben Roethlisberger, he was accused of raping several women and being predatory towards several young women. And this is a story we're all too familiar with. I think the most famous is Brock Turner, and he was a swimmer. He wasn't even a football player, he was a swimmer. Uh, Tom Brady is constantly revered as this American hero. And we forget that when he was dating Giselle Bündchen, the, like, they're like American royalty. They're like the most American couple. Everyone talks about them. 
He was expecting a child with his ex-girlfriend when he started dating Giselle. Like, not even to mention, like, that's not even mentioning Deflategate, where he was literally accused of cheating in football. And people thought, no, Tom Brady would never do that. He's the golden boy. Why wouldn't he do that? Why wouldn't he do that? What did he have to lose? He was never going to be held accountable because no one's ever held accountable for anything that they do. <sighs> I know it seems like I've got enough track, but like there's a pattern here and it's not a good one. But back to the case. So while he was on trial for the murder of Odin Lloyd, he was also indicted for a double homicide that I mentioned earlier. That case gets a lot less coverage and it got a lot less coverage. But it was still just as scandalous. The car that was used for the crime was hidden by a family member. I think her name was Aunt Tanya. And as she was dying of literal cancer, she went on the stand and lied. And lied about holding the car for him. He was found guilty of the murder of Odin Lloyd, but he was acquitted of the double homicide of Daniel De, De Abreu and Safiro Furtado. Again, the real victims here. Five days after this acquittal, on April 19th, 2017, Aaron was found hanging from his jail cell window at 3.05 a.m. The death of anyone is sad, but I truly feel like this suicide overshadowed the deaths of the people he killed. Worse is, because of a law in Massachusetts, ab initio, his convicted was vacated. Basically, this law states that if a convict dies during the appeals process, which he was in the process of appealing, like I said, his conviction for the murder of Odin Lloyd while he was also on trial for two other murders, uh, the case re reverts back to its initial state prior to a conviction. So they're acquitted. Thankfully, because of the pressure from Odin's family and from prosecutors, his conviction was later reinstated in 2019. It did seem like this was an attempt to get money from the New England Patriots for his fiance and daughter. It was argued that the only reason he was let go was because of this murder. And his, if his convic conviction didn't happen, then the guilty verdict didn't exist. So she should have been entitled to compensation through that law. I'm not sure how that's going at this point. I don't know if they ever got money from the New England Patriots. Um, at the end of the day, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want his daughter or fiance to suffer because I don't, especially his daughter, his daughter's not at fault for anything that he did. And now she's without a father, you know? That's so sad. You know, I don't think that they should get money from the Patriots. He killed somebody. The saddest part of all of this was that the death of Odin Lloyd was 100% preventable. There were plenty of crimes in between that could have landed him with a conviction that could have ended his football career and could have prevented Odin from dying that night. There were things I didn't mention because as, the, as is the case with many professional players, there, there was just so many, there was just so much. You know, there were bar fights, there were DUIs, there was reckless driving. And it is said that with the DUIs and the reckless driving, one of them, he was going like 105 through a construction zone and the officer recognized him and let him go and like told him good luck at your game. That could be an urban legend, but just saying. But I mean, his own, like all of his other crimes could have their own fucking video, to be honest. These murders could have been prevented if he would have been convicted of any one of those, any one of those crimes. Even without a conviction, at least one of those should have led to a dismissal. He And if he was dismissed, he never would have been recruited by the Patriots and he would have never been as successful as he was or as recognizable. After his death, Aaron was diagnosed with chronic traumatic and the I'm gonna put it on the screen. Best known as CTE. Uh, many people have heard of it at this point, but it, it, it's a disorder that plagues people that play contact sports. But it also affects people in the military, which I didn't actually realize. The symptoms include behavioral problems, intense mood swings, early onset Alzheimer's, and it just gets worse over time. And it's caused by constant contact after a concussion. Unfortunately, this disease cannot be diagnosed until after a patient's death. So many football players leave their bodies to science in order to have their brains studied. And I'm assuming 
Aaron did as well because they found out and they said that Aaron's case was one of the worst that they had ever seen. Um, I believe that this conversation really kind of hit home with OJ Simpson. I know a lot of people started talking about it around the time of OJ Simpson's case, which I didn't even get into OJ Simpson because I think that's just like, it needs its own video. So if you're interested in that, let me know. I feel like OJ Simpson gets talked about a lot though. The sad reality of this disease, which it is a disease, it's, you know, and even with the research that's behind it, uh, there's not enough to sway federations from making any sort of meaningful changes that can have a positive impact on the sport. They've changed the helmets, but at the end of the day, it, there's still going to be concussions. And while football players are not the only ones affected by this disease, it's one of the most contact heavy sports. And it's a, a sport that most men play from the time that they're like five years old and on. Meaning that it's possible that these men are experiencing brain trauma as young as five years old. So I know tackle sports don't generally start until they're about 10, but like, just imagine that a 10 year old brain experiencing like concussive trauma and then going on to experience that until they're in their thirties and forties. My God, of course they're having brain problems. I had one concussion back in February, a minor concussion, and it's affected my life in a big way. I couldn't imagine have, had I had more concussions, several concussions my whole life. Aaron Hernandez killed three people, at least, and that still wasn't enough to have them make a meaningful change. So if that's not enough, when will it be enough? And the unfortunate reality is a lot of these people do end up committing suicide, either because they have had so much brain trauma that they don't even know who they are, which happened, I can't remember which case I read, but there was one guy who, he, he was 40 years old and he, he had dementia so bad that they, he, he was acting like he was 100. He, his brain was just fried. This story doesn't have a happy ending for literally anyone. There's been no changes and it's unlikely that there ever will be because as long as the NCAA and the NFL are making money, there's never gonna be a meaningful change. Even during a global pandemic, the NCAA, NCAA and the NFL are trying to figure out ways for players to play, how to pack stadiums and have created rules to ensure that coaches are not honest and transparent about which of their players have COVID and I was hoping that I would find petitions to stop the sport or much like women against drunk driving or moms against drunk driving, I really hoped that there would be like an organization like moms against contact sports. But instead, all I saw were petitions to get the NFL and NCAA sports started back. So not a good look, honestly. I like to give solutions at the end of, end of these videos, but there really isn't one. The only thing I can tell you guys is don't watch don't buy tickets. If this is important to us, we need to make a change. We need to make a meaningful change. Don't, don't support them in any way. The more people that boycott the sport, the more likely that they are to make a change. Even a cursory, like I said, even a cursory search for potential petitions was not promising. And honestly, that's it. That's all I have for you guys. And I'm so sad for Odin Lloyd's family. I'm so sad for Odin Lloyd himself. I'm so sad for his girlfriend. And, you know, I hope you learned something from this. I hope you choose not to put your children into contact sports because I think it's dangerous. Um, and I'm not questioning your parenting when I say that. I just, I really think it's dangerous. Um, there's so much to unpack here. So please watch the documentary if you haven't. And yeah, I'm sorry this video is coming so late. Uh, let me know if, what true crime videos you want to see next. Uh, I would love some new ones. Uh, the next one, I don't know what the next one will be, but that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye, guys.